Okay, good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Let me welcome you to today's Provost's uh, Lecture. My name is Nancy Toms. I am a distinguished professor of history here at Stony Brook. Um, it's been an exciting uh, 24 hours here at Stony Brook. We had Spike Lee yesterday followed by my colleague Rob Chase, um, who I hope is, is going to get here later, um, doing a presentation at the Humanities Institute. And today we complete the trifecta uh, with this lecture, uh, which has been generously funded uh, through the provost's office. And I want here to thank Vice Provost Charlie Robbins, who puts this together, and also his boss, Interim Provost Minghua Zhang. They have given me the opportunity to bring to campus and have the honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ian Burney. Ian Burney is a professor of history and the former director, smile on cue, he's very happy to be stepping down um, as the director of the University of Manchester's Center for the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. So he's still going to be at Manchester, but he doesn't have to run the department anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Although Thank you. Ian is now officially a UK citizen, he did retain his dual citizenship. Um, who knows how long that will last? Right. Um, and he is an American by, yeah, by, well, that's true, yeah. uh, by birth and by education. He did his uh, BA in history at Brown University and his MA and PhD in history at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where he worked with the legendary. Thomas W. Lacour. Ian's dissertation became his first book, Bodies of Evidence, Medicine and the Politics of the English Inquest, that came out in 2000. He has gone on to publish a body of work on the history of forensic science that has won him international renown. And I'll mention uh, Poison Detection and the Victorian Imagination. And with Neil Pemberton, he wrote Murder and the Making of the English CSI. With Chris Hamlin, he's edited a collection of essays entitled Global Forensic Cultures, Making Fact and Justice in the Modern Era. This year, Ian has the good fortune to be working on his next book, which you're going to hear about today, as a fellow at the National Humanities Center in um, the Triangle area of North Carolina. I think he will agree one of the best places in the world to, uh, to, to write. Um, and his stay there is also being supported by a fellowship for the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, which is a very prestigious award in our field. So today you're going to get a preview of his fascinating new project. And I will say for people like me who grew up watching Perry Mason, and not in reruns, I may say, <laughs> this perspective on Earl of the man who created Perry Mason, uh, Earl Stanley Gardner, is mind-blowing. So again, thank you, Charlie Mingwa, uh, for making this talk possible. And please now welcome Ian Burney to the podium. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Nancy. Thank you all so much for coming. And especially thank you to Spike Lee for being, the, being my warm-up act. Uh, that's uh, no pressure there. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, as, as, uh, as Nancy says, I mean, most of my work has been, actually, m most all of my work has been um, focused on the UK context, in particular the English context. Um, and this, in some respects, is a, well, not, it's a, it, 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 is a, it is a departure in that I'm now focused on um, the US. And um, what's happened to me as I've been working my way through the material um, at in, in North Carolina at this amazing center. Everybody needs to try to go. It's a, it's, a, it's a pretty spectacular place, and it's a fantastic place to write and think. And um, uh, <clears throat> it's becoming clear to me that uh, this project is, 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 qu is quite different from uh, the, the, the material that I've, uh, and the, the type of writing that I've, um, I've spent the 
my previous career um, sort of doing. And uh, one of the consequences of this is that it's actually, there's, there's very little in the way of the history of forensics and the history of science and history of medicine, so apologies to colleagues um, in, that, in that field. But, um, but I'm, I'm sort of, I'm hoping that I can, um, I can sort of knit things together so that some of my uh, sort of previous ways of, of thinking and ways of analyzing is actually kind of present in this work. Uh, two. Uh, Nancy also tells me that there are um, students in this, uh, in this auditorium who know an awful lot more about an aspect of what it is that I'm going to at least start out with, which is um, uh, carceral studies and, you know, the question of, um, of um, the contemporary uh, sort of questions about innocence and wrongful conviction. And I see uh, the Midwest uh, Innocence, uh, Innocence Project uh, there, so um, there's some trepidation. Uh, that I feel at this point, because what I'm actually, uh, what, I've, what, I've, um, what I've decided to do at, at, uh, at the center is actually to sort of to start from history and to try to work upwards. Uh, so although I'm going to start with some framing observations about uh, the contemporary innocence moment, what I'm actually really going to be focusing on is this um, other um, innocence moment, uh, which takes place in the immediate aftermath of the, of the Second World War and involves some really quite um, interesting, one might even say kind of crazy people, uh, the, the, the leader of the pack being Earl Stanley Gardner. So uh, that's just like by way of initial framing and kind of uh, throat clearing. So, uh, but I'll start with uh, what, you know, for, for all of you I would imagine is quite an uncontroversial observation uh, that in recent years the issue of wrongful conviction has captured the attention of both U.S. criminal uh, justice practitioners and, um, as importantly, uh, the public writ large. Since Gary Dodson became the first person to be cleared by post-conviction DNA testing in 1989, national advocacy organizations spearheaded by, spearheaded by the Innocence Project have championed the cause of potentially innocent prisoners, raised public awareness, and promoted wide-ranging po uh, policy reform. Innocence has permeated, permeated the mainstream culture through news media, books, TV, movies, podcasts, and of course, um, ever uh, present docu-series on Netflix and such. Uh, for most commentators, these developments represent the dawn of a new moral and legal order, an innocence revolution. Uh, and this, mo this movement has enjoyed notable success as federal government, uh, a majority of states and hundreds of police agencies have taken some practical steps towards combating the sources of judicial um, error. Scholarship on wrongful conviction has also flourished, and this is largely focused on estimating prevalence and determining cause. Literature on causes has reached a broad consensus about the most important uh, contributing factors uh, to wrongful conviction, misidentification, um, mistaken eyewitness identification, police and um, prosecutorial misconduct, flawed science, uh, inadequate defense counsel, false confessions, and unreliable informants, a uh, formidable list. Uh, studies on the prevalence um, have focused primarily on the differential demographics of wrongful conviction, highlighting in particular its high correlation in the U.S. with race. Um, in its 19, uh, in its 2017 get to the proper um, uh, century. Um, 2017 report, uh, for example, the National Registry of Exonerations analyzed 1,900 cases from its database of post-1989 exonerations, of which 47% were African Americans. That is three times uh, the rate in uh, the population. So. Wrongful conviction scholarship has contributed important insights into the workings, the abuses of, contemporary, of the contemporary criminal justice system and how the innocence movement has organized uh, to advocate for change. But as, as of now, um, the innocence movement um, has really lacked, at least in, in my view, any kind of proper historical reflection. Instead, history is typically folded into a present-oriented account, which is focused on what it is seen as the defining uh, feature of modern innocence, that is, its access to DNA typing. In such accounts, 
prior efforts to expose wrongful conviction uh, could only be based on one-off reinterpretations of contested, highly contestable um, evidence, and were therefore vulnerable to skeptical challenge. It was DNA that enabled reformers to shift the terrain from legal judgment to scientific certainty, uh, replacing, in the words of Innocent Project co-founder Barry Sheck, quote, speculation and sup supposition and subjectivity with hard science. Now, in the last few years, there's been um, signs of dissatisfaction with this largely ahistorical um, account. And this is due in part, for internal reasons, part due to a growing recognition from within uh, that the conditions underpinning the original innocence moment are themselves historically bound, time bound. On pragmatic grounds, advocates warn that the constant trickle of exonerations will um, eventually lead to innocence fatigue as the press and the public interest um, in the particulars of each new case wanes. At the same time, as old cases of, with unt untested genetic evidence become rarer, the rate of DNA-based exonerations is leveling off. Strategically, moreover, innocent scholars are beginning to argue that um, the importance of replacing the, the, mo the movement's origin story with a more complex and contextualized account that embraces non-DNA cases. Though less absolute, uh, these, they argue, are potentially more revealing and, since most felony cases leave no biological trace, more comprehensive. This is a, a, essentially a dialectical argument in which the crutch of scientific certainty, while historically necessary in order to break the cycle of fruitless pre-scientific anecdotalism, now needs to be displaced by a rejuvenated legal critique. So with all this in mind, I think there's the need for a historically robust consideration of prior regimes of innocence, one that move beyond the standard origin stories and seek to use history as grounds for reflecting on what is and what is not peculiar about our present moment. So this is what I'm, I'm trying to do in this new project, take a bite out of that um, historical um, reframing. Uh, and I'm doing this by focusing on a kind of unlikely set of characters, that is Earl Stanley Gardner and his court of last resort. Um, and so here is why I'm doing that. So today Gardner is, rep is best um, remembered and, and fondly remembered by distinguished professors as, uh, as the creator of Perry Mason. <clears throat> the intrepid attorney who successfully defended underdogs caught up in false criminal charges. Mason's um, fictional heroics, uh, which made Gardner at the time of his death the best-selling uh, American author of the 20th century, uh, were, and look at, look, at all, look at all the books, yeah, um, two books a year, uh, pretty, pretty formidable. Um, so he, uh, the, uh, his fictional heroics were in fact a projection of Gardner's early work um, in representing Oxnard, California's uh, Chinese uh, community. Uh, Gardner's turn to writing, instead of ending his pursuit of justice, enhanced its visibility. In 1948, he founded the Court of Last Resort, a self-appointed body of experts dedicated to investigating and exposing possible cases of wrongful conviction. Now, Gardner's court often features in the brief historical discussions of pre-DNA um, innocence that I outlined at the beginning of my remarks, but as an instance, as, a, as an example um, of insignificant and largely uninteresting one-off cases, uh, this is an oversimplification. Uh, the court's 1952 manifesto, for one thing, outlines a series of uh, structural proposals, many of which foreshadow uh, those of today's reformers, better training and conditions for law enforcement uh, officials to reduce incentives for misconduct, improving the standards of medical and scientific evidence and general, of general witness testimony, and providing legislative um, and, uh, legislation and resources to ensure competent advocacy for impoverished defendants. Moreover, Gardner used his celebrity status to successfully pursue the court's cause within the corridors of power, regularly inviting state and prison governors to weekends at his ranch, attending bar association and law enforcement conferences, and establishing lengthy correspondence with local, state, and federal officials. <clears throat> and like the present-day moment, uh, popular media 
was a central feature of Gardner's strategy. The court's work was serialized over three decades in a leading national magazine, uh, which much more later, and featured in a primetime television show on uh, CBS at the end of the 1950s. So Gardner's project belies existing characterizations of prior regimes of innocence prior innocence campaigns as clearly discontinuous from and therefore uninteresting to our own present. But in fashioning an historical mirror to modern innocence, it's also very important to take account of profound differences, differences rooted in the political, legal, cultural, and scientific context of early Cold War America. So today I want to talk about one such difference uh, rooted in a particular amalgam of popular cultural production, aspirational notions of masculinity and masculine identity, and a vision of endangered American liberties. I'll spend the rest of my time with you today uh, developing this analysis by focusing on the very first case which was taken on by Gardner and the Court of Last Resort. It's a case of frontier justice featuring a gunfight between two sworn enemies set in the California desert. My argument is that the selection of this case for the court's public debut tells us quite a bit about the cultural logic of Gardner's pursuit of innocence in the immediate post-war period. So, <clears throat> first of all, just a bit of back background as to how it is that the court of last resort came into being. In December of 1946, uh, Gardner met with a New York-based magazine publisher, Henry Steger, and the two discussed the peculiar fact that despite Americans' reverence for freedom, there was no popular magazine on the market devoted to the pursuit of justice. At this time, the time of the conversation, Steger was in the process of repositioning one of his flagship magazines, Argosy, to compete in the emer emergent men's market that Esquire had opened up in the previous decade. The visual and textual repertoire of men's magazines in the immediate post-war period uh, reflected what historians for decades have identified as the parlous state of early Cold War American masculinity, produced from an unstable mixture of aspirational virility, anxiety about the emasculating threats of suburban domesticity and white-collar managerialism, uh, desperation to meet the norms of consumerist self-affirmation, and paranoia about the lurking external and internal threats to American freedom. Steger's new look Argosy was designed to represent this fractured identity to itself, serving a middle American everyman with, uh, who was looking for tales celebrating the exploits of unconstrained adventurists features on hunting and fishing, true crime, military and espionage reportage, titillating cartoons of women in various states of often unintended undress, and straight-talking advice about how to be a real and successful man. Now, the core feature of this genre was to indulge in what one contemporary critic wearily described as the shibboleth of reader identification in which sedentary readers were encouraged to project themselves into the lives, into lives which were far more vital than their own could ever be. Uh, the editorial policy of magazines in this niche market was, in the words of this critic, quote, calculated to take the reader out of himself, making him identify with men leading a less responsible, more colorful existence than his. Now, for critics, this represented a sad erosion of the traditionary literary magazine format, an appeal to a one-sided male existence that, quote, stimulated red corpuscles rather than fought. <clears throat> Though fully committed to the constitutive features of reader identification, Steger, a Princeton grad, uh, wanted to counter criticisms of mindless masculine stimulation by associating vicarious adventurism with a thoughtful and ennobling cause. Now, this is what drew him to Gardner's interest in wrongful conviction and ultimately to associating uh, that cause with, um, with the Argosy magazine. Steger pledged uh, sufficient column space to pursue in monthly installments and without knowing the outcome in advance, the twists and turns of ongoing investigations of potential wrongful conviction cases. 
The quality and integrity of these investigations were to be guaranteed by convening a board of investigators composed of men who were specialists in their own line, men whose national reputations ensured reader confidence in their judgment, men who, who would be public spirited enough to donate their services free to the cause of truth and justice. So forged in this crucible of an idealized version of American justice, secured by men of skill whose incorruptibility was guaranteed by their transcendence of venal motives, the court of last resort offered its services um, in a way as a modern frontier policy, providing disinterested in expertise in the service of a just and humane public. Habitually photographed in Western gear, um, complete with tin star, you can, the Texas Rangers star, uh, you can see there, and publicly reveling in the frontier lifestyle that he acted out um, on this sprawling uh, ranch in, Southern in the Southern California desert, Gardner took on the role of the presiding sheriff. And he selected his deputy with due care to their complementary skill set and their irreproachable integrity. So that's the scene that's set. And so I now want to turn to this story, the story of Bill Keyes. Uh, which is going to provide the narrative and conceptual framework um, and the thread that runs through the remainder of what it is that I have to say for you to, to you today. It was Keyes' plight that Gardner and Steger selected to launch their public crusade against wrongful conviction. And there was a clear logic, I argue, to this selection. The Keyes script fits seamlessly with the core themes and tropes out of which the Argosy's vision of an essential and freedom-loving post-war uh, male, American male, was being formed. So, um, just a quick story of, um, about Bill Keyes. So, Bill Keyes uh, was made for Argosy. Born into a Midwestern Quaker family in um, 1879, the adolescent Keyes had yielded to the lure of the frontier, heading to the desert southwest at the age of 15 to work as a ranch hand and to try his luck at prospecting. In 1910, he laid a homestead claim in the little San Bernardino Mountains, a then largely undeveloped expanse of government land that would in time become Joshua Tree National Monument. For the next several years, Keyes proved up the land, married, and began to raise a family. During this time, the Shays, a, a family of cattle baron and local officials, um, including the sheriff of San Bernardino County, were grazing their large herd in the area. And when, in 1917, Keyes filed his um, ownership claim, his claim to the homestead, which he had proved up, the Shays began a lengthy campaign of harassment and intimidation. <clears throat> Instead of yielding, the rugged individualist Keyes took up another homestead in, in 1918, uh, which the Shays also had um, hotly contested. Tensions uh, festered in the ensuing years and intensified when Worth Bagley, a retired Los Angeles deputy, bought some land uh, that bordered the Keys Ranch. Bagley soon aligned himself with the Shays and opened up his own set of disputes with Keys over property access. On the 11th of May, 1943, this feud ended in bloodshed. According to Keys, Bagley had sneaked up to the rise and fired at him. Uh, the bullet mi missing him by inches. Keyes returned fire, striking Bagley on the arm. Bagley then jumped off the road, pulled his gun as, as if to shoot again. Keyes fired twice, hitting him once on the left arm and once on the side. Quote, this is Keyes, he dropped and groaned. I didn't go look, he was dead. Keyes was arrested, tried on first degree murder count, convicted on the lesser charge of manslaughter and sent to San Quentin. So even in this highly truncated description, you'll probably have the sense that you've seen this one before. And so had most of the people in the Keyes case. And it was precisely this familiarity and the imaginative associations that flowed from it that made this the ideal case, the ideal vehicle for launching the court as a new and inextricably intertwined exercise in justice and in publishing. Gardner certainly had already seen it. He had first heard of Bill's, uh, Bill Key's incarceration in May of 1947 when he received a letter from Francis Keyes, Bill, Bill's wife, asking him to intervene. But this wasn't a cold call. Some two decades previously, Gardner had camped 
out on the uh, Keys property and had indulged in his love of communing with real frontier folk by getting to know the couple. Francis's um, initial letter to him, his, her plea for help, contained two themes that would dominate the Argosy's coverage of the case and also that helps to explain why it is that this came to so interest Gardner and Steger. First, she told of the 30-year conspiracy by ruthless cattlemen and their corrupt political co-conspirators to drive an honest homesteader from his land. Second, she framed the case as one that would appeal to Gardner's engagement in the LA fiction industry. Quote, I wish you could take the case and then write the story and perhaps write a movie of it, she, she wrote. It would be, this, would, this is, would be a picturesque place for it, having been um, here, you know what it is like. Gardner's response expressed shock at Keyes' conviction and uh, confirmed his past association with the family and their place within a physical landscape that for him carried strong emotive connotation. So this is a quote from Gardner's letter in response to Francis Keyes' letter. <clears throat> I think, I think of you people quite often, and I've wondered how you were getting along. Every once in a while, when I announce my intention of taking a trip, but somehow I never get around to it, I think perhaps there's a subconscious feeling that the influx of civilization has made such great changes that I would prefer just to keep the old memories. Again, this response sets the Keys case within a framework that is much more about an individual case of potential injustice. Oops. Um, injustice. It's an injustice done to an individual man, yes, potentially, uh, but more importantly to an ideal, that of a rugged individualist, a two-fisted desert rat. And it was this ideal that captured the essential imagery that would come to saturate the Argosy coverage and thereby presented its readers with what Gardner thought would both capture their imagination and place that imagination uh, in the service of American freedoms. Argosy readers' sense of justice and injustice, in other words, was set within a narrative framework that Gardner assumed they knew through their own consumption of popular westerns on film and in pulp novels and magazines, and like Gardner's own lament over lost, lost authenticity, longed to vicariously embrace. <clears throat> so it was this frontier tableau uh, that at once made sense of Keyes' case and structured the court's engagement with it. Now, I've, I've only got one time to, get, time to give you one small example of this in the time that I have less, and that is the way in which Gardner and his trusted medical legal deputy, uh, a, board, a sort of board member, conceptualized and presented uh, the, their challenge to the crime scene invest, um, um, evidence that had been presented at the Keyes uh, trial and that had uh, sent him to San Quentin. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, th th this, this, this is basically how it is that um, the Argosy is, is kind of, um, is, is presented text, um, lots of images, cooking with dynamite is, um, is the tagline for um, Steger's editorial address to, you know, remember like, you know, a direct reader address. This is how, this, this, this is how he, um, he signals what it is that's going to be happening in the magazine to the reader and it invites them into this kind of the spirit of adventure cooking with dynamite being the perfect example or the perfect rallying cry for what it is uh, that they are uh, doing. So when the sheriff and his deputies, so this, 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 is, this goes back to the original crime scene investigation. When the sheriff and his deputies arrived at the scene of the, of the shooting, they had found uh, Bagley lying face down, a Colt revol revolver um, in his uh, cocked, um, a, a cocked Colt revol revolver clasped in his right hand with his forefinger on the trigger. Photographs of the scene were taken. They discovered uh, one set of footprints in the desert sand, which they concluded were made by Bagley. There were no other markings that were noted on the ground surrounding the body. Bagley's gun was then examined and found to have fired a single bullet, uh, which they located embedded in, in, um, in Keyes' pickup truck. 
<coughs> a local chemist later in, uh, visited the scene to search for trace evidence amid the soil and vegetation where Bagley had fallen. He found spots, blood spots, and bone, uh, uh, bone and tissue fragments, uh, which he subsequently identified as being of human origin. Uh, he then visited the Keys house where he re re retrieved a pair of trousers with, red, uh, with small blood stains on the upper inside leg area, all of which he noted pointed in an upward direction. At Keyes' trial, the prosecution wove these findings into a damning reconstruction. Keyes' first shot, they argued, um, which hit ba uh, Bagley's shooting arm, would have caused him to drop his gun. The shape and direction of the blood spatter on the soil and vegetation next to Bagley's body was evidence that Bagley had been lying prone on the ground when the fatal bullet struck. The upward pointing uh, blood spots on the trousers, which were found in the Keyes house, moreover, was evidence that Keyes had been standing over Bagley when he fired the final shot, so the blood spurted upwards. According to the DA, the conclusion to be drawn from these indications was obvious. Keyes had ambushed Bagley. The first shot had rendered him helpless. Keyes then finished him off, um, the, finished off his enemy in, in a cold, cowardly execution after which he placed Bagley's hand, uh, gun back in his hand um, in order to make it appear that there had been, they had been in a fair gunfight. By killing the prostate Bagley, uh, Keyes had forfeited um, at once the legal claim to self-defense and his ability to frame his actions within a generically sanctioned code of the West. In his efforts to overturn this reading of Keyes as a dishonorable frontierman, uh, Gardner turned to the forensic powers of his trusted medical legal deputy, the Michigan-based criminologist, Dr. Lemoyne Snyder. After a review, a full review of the evidence, Snyder's response uh, was reassuring. There was no reason whatsoever to revise uh, the dominant conceptual framework and cultural framework within which Gardner, through the Argosy, had been operating um, since he had first heard of the Keyes case, in which Keyes featured as an honorable participant in a well-established ritual of frontier justice. He concluded his report, this is Snyder, uh, with a telling remark, quote, it seems to me, Snyder wrote, that it was just an old-fashioned gunfight, uh, like that, I, li like I have paid many a nickel to see in the movies. So, I mean, what's, what's interesting to me about this thing is that even with his expert hat on, even as he is writing his expert medical legal report, um, as he com contemplated flesh and blood in an actual homicide, uh, Gard uh, Snyder, just like everybody else, was directly or vicariously engaging the case, who, who was, who was um, engaging the case, felt compelled to view it through this cinematic uh, lens. So when Argosy readers turned to Steger's cooking with dynamite column for February um, 1949, they found themselves uh, the subject of lavish praise. Quote, you readers can go look at yourself in the mirror and congratulate yourselves on the great achievement, Bill Keyes is free. That poor victim of injustice has been released from San Quentin on parole, and he's out because of the court of last resort. It's our first victory, yours and the experts you have directed to investigate in this case. For Gardner, writing in his own column, a clear path of victory um, lay ahead, and virtue lay ahead. Quote, now that we've won the first fight, let's throw all of our energies um, into those ahead. Let's give the underdog a break. So to conclude this account of the court's debut case, I want to consider how this characterization of Keyes as a poor victim um, in need of assistance fit and at the same time did not fit within the dominant narrative that had been cast around Keyes and that had served to make him a person of interest to the Argosy readers. I want in particular to stress the tension between the ideal of self-restraint uncompromising, defiantly independent frontier masculinity that had carried the key story from the outset and the compromised, commodified product that was Argosy's stock in trade and that had served as the grounding logic of that very same ideal. 
So the very idea that Keyes could be cast as a poor victim and as an underdog was something of a rupture to the persona that had been so carefully curate, curated for him in the pages of the magazine. To be sure, <clears throat> the, the story of his persecution by powerful venal interests might readily qualify him for martyr status, but like all martyrs, it was Keyes' steadfastness, his refusal to yield to pressure and to compromise his sense of right that had led him to his fate. This placed him squarely within the established tableau of frontier justice in which the good, uh, though they may not always triumph, are never abject recipients of pity. And yet, Key's two-fisted individualism at key points in his story required just such a compromise. Take one example. Steger's victory announcement glossed over the fact that it was um, Keyes's, that Keyes' conviction had not been overturned as wrongful, uh, but Keyes was instead freed on parole, the stain of his guilt still standing, at least in the eyes of the law. Keyes' acceptance of this role, of the grateful recipient of official largesse, was the outcome of a bro broader pro process of negotiation, one that was orchestrated by Gardner, designed to maintain Keyes' status as a person whose innocence mattered mattered to the Argosy readers. This is best illustrated by a letter to Francis in which Gardner drove his point home in no uncertain terms. Quote from Gardner, I think Bill, if Bill doesn't cooperate, the magazine will lose all further interest in the case. In fact, it is terribly important that Bill understand what we are trying to do and accept the parole if offered to him. So this domestication of Bill Keyes exemplified, in my view, the tension that animated the Argosy as a commercial enterprise competing in a highly specific and highly volatile market that had placed its resources at the disposal of an organization dedicated to its own idiosyncratic pursuit of justice. As a commercial concern, the Argosy depended on its ability to sell an, idea, an ideal of red corpuscled direct action masculinity to a consumer whose embrace of that ideal was largely aspirational and tinged with the layered anxieties of self-diagnosed inauthenticity. In other words, the court made its home within a representational world that was dominated by the logic of commodification that underpinned the post-war men's uh, magazine market. Another example <coughs> of this process that I'm trying to uh, convey here appears on a single page of the December 1948 Argosy, the page of Gardner's, um, late, uh, w that carried Gardner's latest updates on developments in the Keyes case. These included account of, an account of his recent meeting with the California Parole Board at which he presented Snyder's conclusions that Keyes was in fact not guilty. As was typical of any such account penned by Gardner, the members of the board were sized up and determined to be real men, men that were interested in the cause of justice, men with whom Gardner could do business. Here is one po such portrait of one Irvis Lester, member of the parole board. Mr. Lester is a dynamic individual with unbounded vitality. He has the knack of projecting his personality with terrific impact. There's a virile drive to the man. Now this text <clears throat> hovers over a photograph that was, uh, that, uh, a, pho a photo set that brought together two matters of interest to men like Lester, and in so doing, presented for, for the Argosy readers the perfect distillation of why they chose, why they, were, why they were on the case, why they were interested in this case. To the left, the court's principles um, examined, so that's um, Earl Stanley Gardner and Lemoyne Snyder and the hat, woman on the, in the hat, that's, that's Francis Keyes. Um, so they are there um, photographed at the crime scene searching uh, for clues in a chain that links the crime scene search for clues with the thrill of desert prospecting. To the right stood a further species of treasure that the Argosy routinely made available to its readers, Phyllis Keyes, the youngest daughter, captured in the generic pinup pose to be appreciated, woven to the story of her family tra family's travails, and ultimately consumed. <clears throat> From an exchange of letters preserved in the Gardner archive, it's clear that Frances Keyes disapproved of this image. <clears throat> but Gardner assured her that this was not only proper, but absolutely necessary. 
and his assurances simultaneously laid bare the purpose the image served, the broader framework of commodification within which it was placed, and, and at the same time served as an indication of the tensions that ran through the staging of this, the court of last resort's first case. <clears throat> first, Gardner made it clear uh, that he had been shopping the Keys case around Hollywood um, and had used Phyllis's photograph as a part of his sales pitch. Don't let physics, this is a quote, this is Gardner quoting, don't let, uh, that's not worked too well, anyway. Uh, don't let Phyllis get excited by this thing because it probably means nothing. If the movies take the story, they will use actors to portray the parts. However, the point is, it isn't doing any harm to let them take a look at her. Uh, take, take a look at Phyllis's picture, and, uh, and, and in publicity, which would be released in connection with any picture, they would give the kid a break. Gardner then responded to Frances's concern about the way that her daughter was to be presented in print, and this response makes explicit how the image functioned within the broader representational strategies that was being deployed to make the readers interested in her husband's plight. Quote, while you may think her clothes are a little skimpy, I don't think it's going to hurt anything. She's a darn cute kid, and you've published that her picture, and a lot of people will start ta taking an interest in the case. <laughs> to complete this logic of commodification that this letter and this visual reference so perfectly captures, Gardner redirects attention back onto the, domesticate, uh, onto the need to domesticate it, the two-fisted persona that stood at the center of the story. Quote, if we get a picture worked out, there'll be some money in it. All this stuff is in a very formative stage, perhaps nothing will come of it, but this is a very important reason why I want Bill to cooperate. <clears throat> so even before the shootout, the forces of commodification and domestication had been closing in on the Keyes' world of frontier authenticity. By the mid-1930s, construction um, of paid roadways, a railway line, and an army base made the Keys, co Keys country at once more densely populated and accessible to tourism. The same process of penetration led in 1936 to the creation of Joshua Tree National Monument as a national park on federal lands bordering the Keys Ranch. While Keyes was imprisoned at San Quentin, the park's popularity so soared. In 1940, it had welcomed 20,000 visitors. By the mid-1950s, this figure had reached 300,000. National Park de uh, designation on land surrounding his holdings introduced stringent new restrictions on Keyes' ability to master and live off the desert's bounty. The grazing of stock, mining, destruction of national vegetation, and the construction of any kind was prohibited on national parkland. Just as it experienced with the Shays, the Keyes, Keyes again had neighbors uh, that were threatening his liberties and his ways of life. And the Keyes were inextricably, inextricably drawn into the vortex of this new west and led to traffic in its currency. Gardner did what he could to help this process. In the aftermath of the Keyes case, he established a rehabilitation fund uh, which, which offered small financial contributions to those who had been freed by the efforts of the court. The family received at least two such contributions. The first, donated in 1950, was to help them to purchase a machine for making um, a kiln, for making uh, adobe bricks. This style of brick was popular with the wave of urban refugees um, seeking to build their new desert life from authentic material. The ever-growing number of neighbors buying tracts of land just outside of the park perimeter were enthusiastic customers for, their, for the goods that the family uh, could now provide them. In her letter of thanks to Gardner, Francis reported that, quote, they all want to build of adobe and they will buy their bricks from us. Commercial initiatives like this one, however, um, came to little, and after Francis' death in 1963, the aged Keys finally threw in the towel. Here's how the Riverside Press Enterprise took note of the denouement. Quote, Bill Keyes, the rugged individualist of Joshua National Monument, Tree National Monument, has sold his strategic holdings so they can be added to the publicly owned recreational heritage in the high desert. He is now reported to be over 85 years old and, and, and most of his life has been spent amongst the desert um, mining community, uh, in, in the traditions of the mining community or amongst memories of them. 
The traditions include the mine and the mill, gunplay in the courts, the land and the courthouse, and inseparably, the traditions of picturesque personality and publicity. The Park Service completed the circuit of commodification when it designated the William Keyes Ranch as an historical site, and from 1975 offered public tours to visitors in search of an authentic story of life on the, on the lost frontier. Nonetheless, Gardner stuck, struck doggedly to the script to the very end. In a letter um, of sympathy to Keyes, to the other Keyes' daughter, the less photogenic Keyes' daughter, um, on her final passing, Gardner uh, uh, brought Keyes back onto the stage for a final bow, as a man whose life had meshed so well with the complex founding ideals of the now defunct Court of Last Resort. Quote, Bill was just about the last of the old, real, old-time real pioneers, Gardner eulogized, an independent, uh, independent of spirit, willing to fight to the last ditch for what he thought was right, and independent as all get out. I feel a real sense of loss, not only as an individual and as a friend, but as a citizen. There aren't enough people like Bill Keyes left in the world. So really to wrap up, um, <clears throat> Gardner's enterprise in what it is that I've tried to um, lay out here stands um, as a symmetrical counterpart uh, to the present uh, era of innocence, uh, formed in a markedly different political, legal, um, cultural, um, scientific context, but despite these differences, sharing some essential structural features. It's my hope that once this is properly developed, this worked up, this historical framework could be used to rethink the assumptions that undergird much of uh, the, uh, the public and uh, many practitioners' understanding of today's innocence uh, regime. That is that it's only now uh, with, with um, the wonders of DNA that we can reach back to the past to effectively engage with past wrongs. The past is messier and I would argue far more interesting than that. Uh, and uh, that, that, that such a simple story would allow. Recognizing this, I think, opens up a more productive space for attending to the complex and historically situated conditions that undergird all moments of innocence, including that uh, of our own. Thank you. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, I'm Robert Chase, Department of History. So, um, I had a thought about its intersectionality with, with race, but also with sexuality, mm -hmm. centered, mm -hmm. particularly centered around the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So on sexuality and gender, um, the story could also really intersect with what George Chauncey, um, Regina Kunzel, and Estelle Friedman have written about as a sex crime mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. and a fear of growing perversion. Yep. And a response to perversion being um, um, an effort to isolate um, fears of growing prison uh, homosexuality mm -hmm. um, and to do that by social quarantine. So could you, in part, see this innocence project as drawn from a well of trying to reconstruct in a Cold War framework the sort of reified white male citizen? And the other point on race is, of course, you know, there's another innocence project from the Scottsboro mm -hmm. Boys Forward on, um, on, on establishing both uh, the innocence of those who are African American, yeah. but also, um, as Daniel McGuire has shown, the guilt of white men, particularly in sexual assaults. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's going on concurrently with mm -hmm. this, so I just yeah. wonder if you might want to remark on race and, and that intersection. I'm not sure. I, so, so, so there are two questions. One is about um, uh, about um, uh, sexual perversion, maybe sex, sexual violence, uh, and and then the other is 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 race. Is that is that good enough? Yeah. Okay. So, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, and, and and in fact, um, they speak to a couple um, a couple slides here that I that that I that that, that I have. Um, I'll take I'll take the, um, the the Scottsboro the kind of the um, the judicial lynching um, first and then the and then the 
perversion um, sort of second. So um, Gardner, it seems to me, is um, styling himself as a as a um, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a good, open-minded kind of liberal in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, conscious of the fact that um, that that um, that stories of um, of racial injustice are not just bad for America, but bad for Americans' image abroad, as 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 they are as you know the communists are um, are are making uh, sort of play over um, judicial you know judicial lynching, yeah. So um, and 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 so he um, is interested in race, but in in, in particular versions of and particular storylines of race. So here's 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 two examples of what it is that I that, what it is that this is a case that they took up. This is Silas Rogers, who is a uh, an army veteran, um, was accused of um, of of murdering um, a Virginia police officer. Um, the gentleman here in the hat is um, the young James J. Kilpatrick. Uh, so I don't know whether, whether I mean, many of you won't remember this, but, um, but James J. Kilpatrick uh, was, in the 1980s, was the, uh, was the husband of Jean Kirkpatrick, who was the uh, UN um, um, uh, ambassador to the UN under Reagan. James K J. Kilpatrick was the kind of the, the, uh, the conservative pit bull um, commentator who used to have crossfire with Carl Rowan, right? So in his younger days, um, he was a cub reporter on the Richmond Times, and he was where he, where he um, was an arch segregationist, right? Yet, yet in that role, he takes up Silas Rogers' case. The question, and, and, the, and, the, and the Argosy does uh, too. They, um, they, they do a, um, a reader's poll which of the cases um, uh, that, were, that were presented to you in, 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 in this, in this um, do you want us to investigate? And according to, uh, to them, Silas Rogers uh, wins hands down, which is interesting in its own, in its own right. The, the, the reason why, one could, one could speculate that the reason why Kirkpatrick and Gardner are so interested in the case of of Rogers is that it is, it is containable and it is a way for them to demonstrate that justice can be done even to the Afri its African American communities. This is the year after the is it Martin Martin's Town Seven, uh, and the and the Virgin where, where seven African American men were um, executed um, on, ra on, a, on a rape charge, and the governor is looking for an e like an easy victory to kind of all right. So this is this is um, Edgar Labatt, who around the same time writes to Earl Stanley Gardner from the from the uh, Mississippi jail cell. He's been um, he's been uh, convicted of uh, of rape of a white woman on her say so, and he is asking for intervention. Gardner thinks the case is interesting, but, but writes to, to, to Labatt and also to his posse saying, look, this is, we can't handle this one. This is, a, this is a case of rape of a white woman in the Deep South, and the communists are there. And there's no way that we're going to be able to associate ourselves with, with that. So Labatt goes without the court of last resort's intervention. Um, uh, Rogers, Rogers. So it's. I mean, I haven't worked this one out yet, but 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 just to say that that um, that uh, that the question of race, um, judicial uh, lynching, and the kind of the, the geography of of injustice of racial injustice is very much part of that. Now, now to tie it to the perversion thing, um, you have. Okay, so that, that's just what. That's, that's, what he, that's what he said. And, 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 and in particular, to tie it to your question about like the band of, of, of endangered white men. So this is, and I apologize for the quality of the thing, but this is um, Steger's, the, 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 um, the publisher's direct-to-reader appeal in 1953, right? which is basically saying, you know, up until now, the court of last resort has been presented as, you know, 
you guys are, you know, you, you guys are great, right? You know, you're not only hunting and fishing and doing all this good stuff, but you're red-blooded and you, and, and you will defend the principle of, of, of American justice, right? This is when it gets personal, right? Because, but because this, this is where Steger says, you know what, it could be you too. And the choice for who it is that it could be as you is, the, is, is, is this guy who was a typical average citizen, strong, red-blooded uh, red outdoor type, married to a fine woman with a home, a child, established position, married long enough for the relationship to settle into a take-it-for-granted basis on the part of his wife, Perhaps she'd been too absorbed as a mother and a housekeeper. He met a young woman who laughed easily, physically attractive to men, physical intimacy. Uh, and once that happened, he found that his home, his wife, whom he really loved, his hunting and fishing, his circle of masculine friends, his surreptitious visits round, rounded out a happy life. He comes back from one of his, um, one of his hunting trips, goes to, the, goes to the, 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 the girlfriends, oh my God, she's dead, right? She's splayed out on the bed, um, strangled. Obviously, can't, he, can't tell, he can't tell anybody, because what's, you know, what's he doing there, right? And you know, through, through bits of evidence, he gets kind of you know, slowly reeled in, and he gets, he gets convicted. So, so, so this, is, this, is the, this is the vulnerable everyman, right? Uh, who is, who, who, who is it's, it's, it's not just defending a principle, but it's actually, actually defending a potentially vulnerable group, again, as you say, of, you know, Argosy readers, white, middle, you know, middle American guys, right? Um, <clears throat> what's interesting then is that they link this to, so, so I mean, in, in a way that that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a sort of a low cost, um, um, intervention on the part of uh, on the part of the Argosy, right? Uh, because it's actually just it's it's selling directly to its 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 audience, its target audience, right? And it's creating this kind of sense of, well, you know, we live in this in this era in which you know men are supposed to be men. However, um, they 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 are they are kind of trapped within a. Uh, a kind of a, 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 a sort of a sexual economic um, a sort of situation in which um, expressing their true manhood can get them into trouble. Okay, so that's one thing. But then it's linked immediately to um, a, 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 a case of um, a flashing of, sec of, 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 of self exposure, right? And there, what they're doing is they're coming down on the kid, right? Basically saying, you know, uh, we, we are um, uh, kids are suggestible, right? And we can, you know, and 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 we are vulnerable at that, you know, at that level too. So I think you're you're absolutely right. And and I haven't, well, I've I've written up this um, this case at the beginning. I haven't yet turned to the uh, the question of how it is that one turns. Uh, the kind of the classic um, sort of um, um, everyman vulnerability into the ramifying, um, uh, you know, other others uh, that need that need to be brought into the story. But yeah, I mean, those are two very uh, kind of clear uh, themes that I that that I will be engaging. Um, <clears throat> I think that that, that, that that stands in in his biographers as an example of how it is that, at, you know, as a young practitioner, he, um, he took up the cause of communities and individuals who were not represented um, well in, you know, in, in, the, in the American criminal justice system. Um, he, has a, he has a deeply kind of, you know, orientalist um, kind of theme about him. He, 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 you know, he lived out in, 
in China. He's got, he, 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 um, his, his, um, his ranch is full of kind of like little st statuettes of kind of Buddhists and, you know, Buddha and what, you know, and, and what have you. He, his, his early Perry Mason uh, novels, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of kind of the Oriental um, kind of uh, sort of myst uh, sort of mysticism. He's also deeply into um, uh, native sort of the Native American tapping into the. And so one of his uh, one of his early cases, which again I'm going to um, I'm, I'm going to turn to write out uh, write up um, soon, is the case of an, an Apache shaman um, who, in a way, is like this guy and. Not, not like he's like this guy, in that um, he's trapped in a, f in, in a kind of um, a domestic relationship um, which, um, which, 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 with which he is um, found guilty of violently breaking himself. He had a wife, a squaw that he loved, who ended up um, with, a, with a brick on her head. Um, there was written on the side of, so this was out in the open, uh, written on, on, a, um, on, a, uh, on a boulder next to the, the thing, his initials, right? The way that I, I haven't got the, the, um, the, the, the trial transcripts uh, yet, but uh, the way that it's reported in the press and in the, um, and in the Argosy um, is that that is taken by the prosecution and agreed to by the, by the jury as just an, as an Indian way, as a way of kind of expiating um, kind of a cosmic, a sort of a rupture in the cosmic kind of firmament. Uh, you write your name somewhere and that kind of like abs absolves everything. This guy, um, Silas John Edwards, is, is, a, is, is like a high priest of the, of, of, the, of the Apache nation. And Gardner brings him, I mean, it's, it's, it's on the one hand, it's, it's just another um, means of, of, of kind of exposing the Argosy reader to a world of adventure and exoticism and which, which you know, their lives in, I don't know, Milwaukee, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna meet somebody like Silas John Edwards, so here's a, and it's wrapped around this story of justice and injustice. Um, uh, so in, 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 but in a way, it expands the circle of masculine vulnerability to include other, others, right? Uh, which is which I think which I think is interesting. But what is what's fantastic is that, and this is just a detail. Which I mean, if for no other reasons, I want I want to write this uh, piece up so that I can get to this point. So um, so uh, um, uh, Silas John Edwards, the Apache, is an Apache shaman. He has magic powder that he is seen uh, photographed putting onto uh, Gardner, so that Gardner um, can see beyond the lies of his enemies, right? So that's, uh, that's, that's on there, and there's an explanation about how that. But then, Silas John Edwards, because uh, he, he's a shaman, he, he, um, spirits visit him in his dreams, right? And so he tells, he writes to Gardner saying, I got a visitation, I know who did it, it's this guy. And he said, you go and do your magic now, you go give him a, a polygraph, right? So what's, 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 what's fantastic about, because the, the, the polygraph is absolutely kind of, is, is, is fundamental to the court of last, the polygraph in a way is, 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 is the court of last resort's DNA, yeah? It's, it's, it's complicated, but that's, that, 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 that's, that's, that's what it, that, that's, that's how it functions. And, um, and in a way, that exchange is like, an, an exchange between two, two shamans, two kind of medicine men, right? Uh, and and it's, a, it's a knowing one. And Silas John Edwards is basically saying, you know, you don't, you don't really, I, I don't know whether you know how I know things. I know that your way of knowing is no more um, grounded than, than mine. In other words, we're talking, a, we're talking through um, kind of um, myth, sort of mythic, um, ways of creating a fact, yeah? And so that, I mean, if, if for no other reasons, I want to, so, I, yeah, okay, so Oxnard, California, lure of the exotic, fighting for, um, for, the, um, for, the, for the underdog. I think that, that's, how, that's how that story fits. 
So taking off on something you just alluded to, did the court ever take on the case of any women wrongly convicted? Yeah. Um, not many. Uh, one, in fact. Uh, and um, it's a case that involves, um, it's, 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 it's basically, it's, med it's a medical legal case. Um, it's, it's a story of a, um, of a recent, of a, of, a, of a married woman who goes to Las Vegas for a divorce, um, um, uh, is living in basically a flop house. There's a question about whether she's a prostitute or not. You know, she's there in, you know, unchaperoned in, La in Las Vegas. Um, her, the, 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 the flop house owner is, a vi is kind of like a nasty old crone uh, who withholds some, some information from her about her, about her um, divorce. And there's like an altercation and, um, the, and, the, and the crone drops dead. Yeah? And so then the question is, and she's convicted of actually assaulting her, um, a violent, a, a mortally assaulting her, and she's sent to, and she's sent to prison. So there's a, you know, there, there's there, there's a there's there's a fair amount of kind of um, of, of kind of review of the of the of the post mortem um, evidence. A lot of um, sort of experts from from across the country and actually even in in the UK are br sort of brought in to testify as to the kind of the parlous state of the old woman's um, constitution, which would. Uh, mean that basically, you know, if you said boo to her, she'd, she'd, she'd drop dead, right? What is, um, what is interesting about the, I mean, and again, I, okay, so, so I went to, last summer, I went to um, the, uh, the Harry Ransom Center in, in, at the University of uh, Texas for a month, which basically has um, the, Gar the Gardner Collection, and I spent a month, they gave me a fellowship for a month to, um, to basically to go through it. It is enormous, and so I spent my time, like all kind of uh, researchers do these days, not reading stuff, but, like, but just madly photographing stuff. So when I got to the National Humanities Center, I had like 20,000 images that were just on my, on my hard drive, which I needed to sort of put somewhere. And so in, in doing the initial sorting, I kind of I, I, I noticed certain things about cases, right? This case of Emma Johnson, who is the only woman that is on the court's docket, it's, it's all about, first of all, how it is that we, um, that we present her to the Argosy readers as somebody who, despite the fact that she may be a little bit um, errant, kind of uh, in terms of you know, promiscuous, whatever, she still, is worth, um, she still is worth fighting for. The other thing is basically how to, um, how to photograph her uh, because um, she is, according to Gardner, who has a very interesting, um, I mean, he, li he lives in a very interesting uh, kind of homosocial world of kind of broness. Um, and he, so one of the ways in which we, we get to Perry Mason is that, you know, one of the things that everybody knows about Perry Mason is that he doesn't give it up for, um, for, for Della Street, right? So she's constantly kind of, you know, frustrated that, you know, there's this kind of um, handsome kind of, you know, brooding guy who just won't, who won't, who won't, um, I won't kiss her, right? And people get really upset, uh, you know, up, up, upset about that. Gardner, it, you know, operates within, you know, that's another way in which um, Gardner and Perry Mason sort of, he, he, he lives in this um, world in which he is <clears throat> simultaneously seen to be really interested in, um, in the physical attractions of the opposite sex, but at the same time is, is quite kind of um, pr prudish about it, right? And so there's a, there's a really interesting um, sort of exchange about how to photograph this woman to, to simultaneously kind of capture her as a, as, 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 as a magnet of attraction, but not to be too sexual to kind of upset the, um, upset the equilibrium. That's as far as I, 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 I've, I've got with that, but um, yeah. Hi.
Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. I have two questions. The first you kind of begun to get at, which is this idea that Innocence Project say something about society and that that's vulnerable. Um, yeah, I, I, thank you. Um, so do I, you know, we all right? Okay. Um, so the, when I, when I started, uh, work in North Carolina this, um, this past September, um, I had a couple of choices to make. I mean, one was to try to, um, maintain the, the kind of the link between, the, the claim between the past and the present and try to work kind of symmetrically in parallel so that I, I didn't go too far out of one as opposed to the other. I kind of ditched that um, because, because the, the um, you know, I, are, are, you, are, are, are you writing a PhD or are you, are you all right. Okay. All right. So one of the you know one one of the things that everybody I'm sure everybody will tell you is that you know when you have time to write, write. Yeah. Uh, so so what I decided to do was to actually kind of do the stuff that um, I've d done now, which is to which is to open up my box of, of 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 images and just write to what it is that I saw. Right. Um, so I haven't. I have. I. Although um, I, 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 I think that it is um, that, that, that some sort of story about how it is that this can serve again as a as a way of reflecting on um, on a, on a, on a, on, a, on, a pr on a present moment. I'm not even sure what that present moment is anymore. It might very well be more about the um, about the creation of a certain sort of. Um, a, a model of defensive justice around the, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a, a band of white brothers in, 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 in jeopardy in that particular moment. And that obviously, you know, nobody needs to, um, nobody needs to sort of uh, think about uh, or stretch too much to think about wh why that might be an interesting um, kind of historical uh, sort of uh, mirror, but I, but, but I, but I, but I do think that um, there are clear um, there are clear structural parallels, and I'm I'm going to get to the causal state in a second. But um, but for example, you know, leveraging the power of celebrity in order to affect change within um, you know by by tapping into um, official power, right? You know, we've got, I mean, you know, Gardner invites, you know, Earl Warren to his ranch and gets Bill Keyes out. Um, you know, our, our president invites um, Kim Kardashian uh, to the White House and, 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 and pardons Alice, I can't remember her, her um, Walker, right, who then, who then features in Kim Kardashian's slimming, slimming suit, right? Um, um, so, 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 so there's that. There's also the, um, you know, the the power of and 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 the and the and the um, the, the content hunger of new um, media platforms, right? I mean, I think one of the things that I mean, I might be, I mean, <laughs> okay. Um, Obviously, true crime is 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 a is a is a huge um, um, sector, not just of kind of high end Netflix stuff, but of podcasts and you know and 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 it's 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 kind of in a way it's like easy content uh, to gen you know just just to bulk out, right? I mean, in 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 a way, uh, you know, we have again, I mean, with with the with the uh, 
Oh, so let's see. Uh, so this is, I mean, this connects with this. This, this, this is the, um, the ad for the, the, the first um, issue of the, um, of the Court of Last Resort TV show, yeah? Is he, he served 19 years of life sentence for the murder of a beautiful girl. His fiance turned state witness against him, but there was reason to believe he was innocent. Old Gold presents. So, you know, TV is a new medium, looking for, looking for content. Um, men's magazines, you know, the magazine, looking, looking for content. So, so I think that there is a way in which the, um, the um, you know, the, 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 the sort of the, pub, the public enrollment in uh, the, in the, in the power of narratives over innocence is in part, you know, fueled by a, by, by a, by a, by a demand need or, no, a production need, right? Okay, so carceral state. One of the things that is very interesting about um, Gardner and um, that I, is, is, is in one of those boxes that I haven't yet opened is that he's very interested in, um, in rehabilitation. Um, and he, um, he's against the death penalty, and he's very interested in, in, in rehabilitation. And he, 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 he writes um, sometimes for like 20 years, 30 years after, uh, uh, af after somebody is free, like interested in how it is that they have reintegrated themselves, right? Um, and you know, I told one version of that story because I'm look. He's not a he's he's a again. I think he's a very weird man um, on all sort on all sorts of grounds. But like the story that I told at the end of the Keys case, which is basically a story of commodification, right, is one way of looking at it, right. But on the other level, you know, he he kept up a correspondence with that family from. 1943 until he died, right? So um, and so, so and there there are there are really interesting examples of how it is that he is he is um, he's writing to to, to 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 prisoners. He 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 contributes to prison magazines. Right, he writes in prison magazines. Tom Runyon is a big is a, is is one of his um, his. Um, his, he, he takes on the case of Leopold uh, Loeb. No, not uh, Leopold, Leopold, of Leopold and Loeb, and, and, and works for his um, um, uh, sort of pardon. So there is a way, there's a, there, and, and yet that correspondence is kind of like what he, what he does with Keys. It's like, it's my way or the highway, right? You've got, you've got to behave, right? So, so I, 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 I don't know the, I, I don't know in detail, but I, it's, it, this, this is much more than, I think, than just a, um, a, um, a sort of a, a, a kind of a, a quirky footnote. It, it, it is, but, it, but, I, but I think it's more than that as well. I, I, I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but okay, thank you. Uh, I did, but um, Yali uh, started this, but I guess my curiosity is um, if you've spoken to any of the triumvirate, for example, uh, and I'm wondering what their reactions would be for this, because uh, they clearly select their, um, the, the people that they aid, and I could I don't know. I mean, it's. I. I, I think it, they could be a little bit. <laughs> it could be really interesting to see what they have to say about the historical context. You mean my my historical actors? Uh, Brian Stevenson. Oh right. Oh yes. Yes. Oh. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, my my, my only. Um, Kind of dialogue that I've opened up in that world is basically through an historian of science, a guy, a guy called Simon Cole, who's part of the um, National uh, Register of Exonerations. He runs um, uh, he runs the Newcomb Center for um, for Law and Cr um, Criminology and Society at, at Irvine, and um, you know he has been um, you know he's been an expert. He's he's, he's a he's an expert on the history of fingerprinting. Um, but but he's so, so he's he's the person that I kind of 
I um, uh, slowly I, or I carefully dip my toe in the water. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not brave enough yet to sort of like ask for an audience with uh, Brian, St uh, Brian Stevenson, but um, that, would be, that would be wonderful at, so, at some point when I get my, uh, my, 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 myself, to, myself um, uh, prepared to do so. And if you'd like to introduce me, that would be great. <laughs> But yeah, but look, the, the, you know, the, the, the question about how it is that one selects, right, is, is absolutely, um, and it, it's, it's particularly interesting, I think, although I haven't looked at this stuff, in the context of the, of, the, um, of the TV show, because the TV show, for legal reasons, can't be based on real characters. So they have to be, um, they have to be, um, uh, sort of fic fictional kind of amalgams, right? And so there the question is like, you know, there's, there's tons and tons, tons of, because Gardner was never a happy camper. He was very critical of any, anything that was written other than um, written by himself. And he just, he, he, you know, he does not like the way that um, the scripts are, they're not hitting the right note. They're not, they're not representing, because he's desperate for this whole enterprise not to be just entertainment, that it needs to have a serious purpose, that it, and it needs to be, and, and that the individuals don't, I mean, okay, the individuals don't matter, or not as much as the principle that they, what it is that they represent, right? So that's the, you know, and so he's constantly, and, and, and the criticism of the Court of Last Resort is they're just trying to sell magazines. And to some extent, that's absolutely right. Uh, but, but, but there is this kind of tension. And, 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 so, and so Gardner, look, Gardner sells millions of copies of Perry Mason. He doesn't need whatever is coming from the magazine. So he is, he is um, uh, desperate for it to be high-minded. Now, what's in, what I just found out and what I'm doing, I'm, I'm, then I'll, I'll stop very soon. The, the, I'm, I'm going to, to spend a, a, a week at the New York Public Library starting next week looking at the Argosy papers and the papers of, of Henry Steger. It turns out that Henry Steger in the 1960s, in the early 1960s, was the president of the Urban League. Right? So, uh, so that's, a, that's a, um, yeah, that's, that's odd. 